Hi, welcome to the Business Class ESL Break Room. We're a company of passionate language trainers and coaches. We're here to share ideas, to improve our skills, and strengthen the training community. Come in for some inspiration, leave with tips to apply to your sessions today. In today's episode, we are focusing on presentations. While as trainers, we may be fairly comfortable speaking in front of others, it's not always a given that we're at ease doing a presentation, let alone training someone else in this important skill. Luckily, our guest today is experienced business class trainer Jerry Graham. From big corporations to little startups, Jerry has trained countless non-native professionals faced with presenting in English. So he's here today to talk with us about some of his best takeaways, go-to tricks, and surefire suggestions for efficient and effective sessions on presentations. Whether you have little personal experience in formal presentations, or you're a trainer with years of giving talks under your belt, you'll come away with something to bring to your next session. So Jerry, thanks so much for coming back. I'm really excited to pick your brain. You're welcome. Nice to see you again. It's great to see you. It's this time of not seeing anybody. I'm really happy to see you in person. Um, so if we may, could we start with some basic concepts for the least experienced among us? And for example, I mean, somebody who may not have given formal presentations before becoming a language trainer. Well, yeah, um, a lot of people are afraid when they see something like, I need presentation help or I need meeting help. For somebody who may not be experienced in that type of field, they panic because they say, but I'm not experienced in giving that type of explanation. Sure. But what is important for you is to remember that you are not necessarily, you do not necessarily have to be an expert in presentations, but in the language of presentations. Mm. And a lot of people think, you know, presentations, I have to know everything. No, you have to know the language that will help the person to get his message across them. Yeah, that's reassuring. That's true. Mm -hmm. And so what advice would you give an inexperienced public speaker when tasked with training presentations? Well, for training with presentations, I would ask the, um, the, tr the trainee uh, basically what uh, he has to present mm -hmm. and why he has to present it. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you can find out a little bit of his needs in mm -hmm. the presentation and his audience. Mm, because in in English, uh, I always say to to the participants and also for the trainers as well, that when you're making a presentation, um, there are three questions you should think of, especially for the trainee, but also it'll help the trainer. Um, and the three questions are: um, What is the presentation for? Who is the audience? Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do to the audience? Do you want to inform, criticize, explain? Mm -hmm. And there's a final one as well, which is how do you want to do it? Does that mean do you want to be aggressive? Do you want to be polite? Do you want to be um, sort of teasing the people? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like adding a flavor. What yeah. flavor of presentation it's, it's do an, you want it's to an, give? It's an addition. And, and I think that the, the trainees and the trainers, especially the trainers, can work on that because it's a way of getting the presentation to become more lively and not just a, a reading a, a text that is so boring that everybody goes away and says, um, what happened in this presentation? I don't remember anything. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea of um, what flair do you want to give yeah. it. That's a, that's a really good uh, way to wash it over with yeah. color. Yeah. Thank you for that. Now can we turn our attention to someone who is a season, who's seasoned already at training presentations? Maybe you could share something with us that's kind of out of the box or out of the textbook um, practices to breathe some life. Well, you just did, but <laughs> what else could you offer for someone who already knows? Well, for somebody who already knows it, like, you know, if I talk about my experience with presentation, I've been working on presentation help since about 1997, no, sorry, 1987, so it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's never real, never think that the, the, each presentation will be the same. Always be careful mm -hmm. of the unexpected in a presentation, and especially for the 
the people now because our ideas of presentation have changed so much over the years. Like a long time ago, we had um, the plastic slides that we used to use with an overhead projector. Mm-hmm. Now we're working on um, PowerPoints and now we're working through Zoom because of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So our ways of presenting are different and not only a formal presentation because people confuse um, a presentation always by thinking, yeah, I have to stand in front of a group of people to explain what I want to do and what I want to show them. But a presentation is not just PowerPoint. And a lot of people forget that. And I see, Sue, you look a little bit confused here because you're expecting a bombshell here. (laughs) No, I'm just excited to hear what's next. (laughs) A presentation can also be, if you're on a trade fair, which of course we're not at the moment, you're explaining how uh, a project is organized or how a product is made. Mm-hmm. Or you're explaining about the company, okay, that can be face to face with no basis of um, paper in front of you. A presentation would be on the telephone. True. Because true. you have to mm-hmm. realize that when, when you're telephoning a, a client, uh, a potential client, or even a normal, uh, a, a regular client, when you're explaining something to somebody, you're presenting. True. And people forget that, that they think, oh, presentations, I, I, it's PowerPoint, that's it. No, presentation is everything. Presentation is also, for example, when we were at the beginning, when we started to uh, teach, I'm using the word teacher because it was what we used before, um, people on how to introduce themselves. Mm-hmm. And that was a type of presentation. Yeah, of course, if you break it down, all of these communications yeah. where you are explaining yeah. something and yeah. you have an audience, yeah. maybe of one, one, it's still an audience. It's still an audience. Huh? It's true. Like, it's for example, point. I'm making a presentation to you, but you can't see me. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, if we can go back um, to the question of, you know, an experienced trainer, what might be a po- some pointers you have that most trainers miss? Um, I think sometimes, um, and I might sound a bit sort of presumptuous when I say this, sometimes um, trainers try to get the participant, the trainee, to be word perfect. Mm. And it can stress the trainer, the trainee mm. to be word perfect because he thinks, I have to say this expression because it's a good expression and my mm. trainer told me to use this expression. And my rep- response to that is no. You can give the students two or three expressions and let the person say what he feels more comfortable with. Yeah. Because there are ways of saying things. And, you know, we as English trainers, or if you're a French trainer or whatever, or an Italian trainer, if, if you're lots of people listening to this, you sometimes think, yeah, but this is a really good expression I think they should use. But, and I'll give you an expression. I'll give you an example, sorry. Um, it's like a long time ago you can say I wonder if you wouldn't mind giving me your pen please (laughs) it's a perfect expression and I remember a lot of um, French people at the beginning tried to use this and I said there's a simpler way I said but it's a good expression I said yes but you cannot maybe use it I said you can say could you give me your pen Mm -hmm. it's exactly the same so it's this idea of don't complicate it for the participant Realize what the level of the participant is and work on that level. Yeah. Give him, I admit, give him more expressions, give him more complicated expressions if you want, but warn them that sometimes these expressions can backfire if they're not said correctly. Oh, yeah, good point. <clears throat> but I love the idea of giving them permission to just use what's comfortable, even yeah. physically. Sometimes the physicality of yeah. some words are just, you find yourself tripping over them. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do the same. I say, mm. choose the one that suits you mm. as well, which is great. And also another thing for maybe for experienced trainers, not only experienced, but all types of trainers doing presentations, is help the participant, the trainee, work on his body language. Mm. Because people seem to forget that body language is also very important in a presentation if you're doing a physical PowerPoint presentation. Mm-hmm. Or, especially now with Zoom, because you can see all of the facial expressions sometimes really close up and it's 
And if the participant says something he's not convinced at, uh, it doesn't give a good impression mm -hmm. for the people who are listening to him. Mm -hmm. Or, um, again, and I have had this experience in different different companies. Um, you know, when you're training people to make presentations, uh, um, you have to also be careful of their clothing. Uh huh. And I'll give you an example of that. I had one student one day who was a sales um, person who was making a presentation, a very formal presentation in a large company that I worked for. And he stood up and he, his um, jacket was buttoned the wrong way. Oh, no. Um, and another person came and he was wearing a jacket, but the jacket sleeves were too long for... Uh, his arms, and he looked like um, a clown, unfortunately. Oh, no. And so it was taken away from what message was being given because, yeah. you know, it's something that is important. I'm not saying to be dressed up in uh, uh, Dior, Lova, whatever, but, you know, just be careful. Yeah, neat and tidy. Yeah. May I also just jump on to what you said about Zoom as a personal thought is I notice um, eye contact and sometimes it takes a while to get it right, and it might be worth practicing with the coworker. Because sometimes I notice if I think I'm looking in my computer's camera, and then I see the video later, mm -hmm. I realize that I look like I'm looking above yeah. the trainee, and it's very distracting. So it's honestly worth practicing to see that you're giving eye contact yeah. when you're training. Well, they, they, there's a technique for that as well, because a lot of people, oh, sorry, I'll start again. In front, eye contact is extremely important. And sometimes it's, it looks, it sounds a little bit, a little bit like the snake in, in Jungle Book, uh, where you have, uh, it's the song, I have confiance en moi, have, have trust in me. Oh, and he's um, staring And he's the looking boy. in the eyes to, to um, hypnotize the person. Um, sometimes Anglo-Saxons don't like that. Looking in the eyes directly in this piercing look. Of, it can be a bit unnerving. Yeah, it can be very destabilizing for, for Anglo-Saxons because... I remember Anglo-Saxon, normally we look at the face rather than the eyes. Really? Yeah. Oh, no, that's interesting. It's a, it's a completely different uh, different style. We have to have our distance. You remember the famous film, Dirty Dancing? Your space, my space. Right. Well, it's personal space, but I, I yeah. never thought... It's interesting. I hadn't thought about the fact that we... I thought it was important to look in eyes, but... Yeah, yeah, maybe not too intensely. Yeah, That's not too true. intensively. People so I always not, <laughs> make a joke at this by showing the, the film a jungle book to show them that, you know, this can be very sort of aggressive at times. Now, to get out of that, looking at the person directly in the eyes is a technique that I learned years ago. Um, and I can't remember who taught me or where I learned it from. But it's not looking at directly at the person in the eyes, but fixing a point uh, uh, between the two eyebrows just above the nose. And ah. if you look at the person um, just above the nose, the person thinks you're looking at their eyes, but you're not. And I'm doing this at the moment with Sue, yeah. and I don't know if she realizes... <laughs> I'm looking at doing the same thing. And, practice. and I don't know if she realizes that I'm yeah. not looking at her eyes, I'm looking at above her, above her eyes. And it's a technique for people who are, are, get stressed in presentations. Because there are people who get stressed because of this constant stare. Very interesting. I love that point. Thank you. Um, I have another question here, which is, um, what has been a tip or practice that learners come back and thank you for later? That learners have come back and thank you. Well, for. there's one which I haven't talked about, so I'm going to talk about it now, is that when I have a person who, no matter what level, because I have done it in the past as well, when I'm making presentations, both in French and in English, because I had to make presentations to 200 students at a time. Uh, in an engineering school so what I did was I had my slides and I wrote what I was going to say per slide I wrote the text what I wanted to say mm -hmm. and I've told people who are afraid of not getting the message across to write what they want to say but not necessarily read the text but it's like a basis for them it's like a prospect as we say here in France where they um, can print out their presentation with what they, they call the, um, the commentaries or the um, explanations. And at the top of the page, you have a picture of the slide. And at the bottom of the page, you have the text that they're going to use. It's like a script, you're like saying. Like a script. Okay. Yeah. And what it is, is, for example, in the, in the script or in the text, whatever, you can put, for example, pause mm, in mm -hmm, the sentence. So mm -hmm. that you come to a part and you... 
pause to mm-hmm. give effect. It's or almost you put like stage directions. Like stage directions. Uh, yeah. Or you can um, put something in italics or something in bold that's like, important to talk about to put insistence on the on the, um, the expression or the word. Mm-hmm. And, for example, a lot of people get asked questions during the presentation. And so what I say to people, it's good if you have a, a text or a script uh, because you can mark with a pen where you stopped. Mm. So that you can start again where you stopped off instead of getting confused where you were, what you were talking about. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I like that. And it helps you to organize your presentation a lot better. Mm-hmm. It helps, you know, it's like uh, when you do a roadmap for a, a, a training session. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. We... You, can, you can organize what you're going to do. Helps you keep, keep, keeps you on track, yeah. which is what you need, especially in a presentation because there's so much more chance you're going to get yeah. distracted. Yeah. Just one more thing about the, that for the present person, for the, the, the experienced trainers or any trainer, is re- remind the participant that um, they are the leader of the presentation. That means that they control the room. The room does not control them. Mm-hmm. And when they're making a presentation, they have to be careful that it's not going into a meeting. By too many interruptions. By too many interruptions that lead to lots of different... Uh, things that are not necessarily um, included in the presentation and a technique to stop that happening is actually to switch off the presentation put a blank screen up do you mean when somebody interrupts with a question you put well, a blank a screen up a long time up? ago what we used to do we used to say to people is, is put a blank screen up and get the person to repeat the question because that meant that everybody would listen to the question Okay. because when they see a blank screen they're waiting for something to happen Okay, so let's say someone says, okay, could I interrupt you with a question? Yeah. And you say, okay, but you shut off your screen or yeah. your slides. Yeah. And then once you've answered it, you go back to your slide. Once, 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 once the person has asked the question so that everybody hears them, yeah. then you put back up the slide again and then explain it to the people. What, what the, or you, you, you explain the, or you give the answer to the question. Okay. I'll, I'll repeat that again because what, basically what it is is, a person asks a question usually in a presentation and not everybody is listening to the question. Right. So, um, because then sometimes maybe this, another person will ask the same question later. So what I suggest is you put uh, a blank screen up when a person has already asked the question and oh yeah, Paul has a question. So everybody will listen to the question. Mm, mm-hmm. And then Paul asks his question for the second time and you put the screen back up again and you talk about what the question or what the answer you will give to the question. That's a nice tip. It's a nice way of remaining yeah. in control of yeah. what's happening yeah. and keeping things and, on track and, again. And one thing as well that a lot of I've seen happen a lot of times, especially in Latin types of Latin uh, presentations, because I have had experience with in a multinational company with a multinational um, training course in the UK, where we had people from uh, um, Spain, France. Uh, Austria, Romania, etc., mm-hmm. who came over, and it's the problem of when a person asks a question that maybe the answer is at the end of the presentation or later on in the presentation. Latins especially try to answer the question before you come to that part of the presentation. They anticipate, they, they jump across maybe three or four slides. The, the person giving the presentation yes. yeah. will jump ahead to answer yeah, a question rather than saying to the person who asked that question, which would come up later, said, oh, just hold on to that question, and I'll speak about that in a few minutes. Okay. And uh, because the Germanics don't like that. They like everything in they order. Like everything in order. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, uh, uh, a Latin um, presentation sometimes can jump around. And oh, okay. people okay. don't follow what's happening, and you lose your credibility. So it's important to set out front uh, yeah. when questions will be answered and how. Well, the question can be asked, but you may, you don't have to answer the questions immediately. But it, it, I'm saying maybe the idea would be to say in the beginning, yeah. we will take questions yeah. at the end or yeah. we will take questions yeah. in the beginning, yeah. but please hold on for yeah. the answer or something yeah. like that. You, 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 mm-hmm. you, you tell the, 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 the trainees that they are, I remember, always in control of the room. Okay. That they can say when they would like to have questions. Mm-hmm. Just warn them that if they say they can have questions during the presentation, it's not a free-for-all. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. So that brings me to this question here. What is something that they never cover in ESL materials that you wish they would? 
And I think it's the fact that there's a there's a thing which is called um, the N O A. The N O A. N O A. What do you think N O A is? Tell. Oh, he's training me. <laughs> training the trainer. Um, Train the trainer today. N O A. Yeah. Never something. Never on uh, a Sunday. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's called negative object analysis. Objection analysis. And a negative objection analysis is getting the participant to think about questions that could come up in the presentation that he hasn't covered. Mm-hmm. So that he's prepared for them and can give them like off the top of his head. Uh, fantastic. That's what we do in coaching, kind of preempting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's preempting things. Okay, mm-hmm. but it's it's the idea that the the participant will not be caught off guard, mm-hmm. uh, and if he doesn't have an answer to a question, and you have to insist on this, the trainers must insist on this. If the participant does not have an answer to a question, he says he does not have an answer. He does not try to bluff. If the presenter doesn't have yeah. the answer, yeah, yeah, yeah. be oh, honest, be yeah. upfront. But the trainer, the trainers must insist on this with the presenter when they, when they're giving the presentations course. Then. Oh, insist on yeah. allowing them, the, yeah. giving them the permission to say we don't we don't have the answer. Can I get back to you? Okay, and training them to say that yeah. and to feel okay, which yeah. may differ from culture to culture yeah. Yeah. as to whether or not they they feel acceptable yeah. Yeah. doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big one. Yeah, and a long time ago there was yeah. a technique for that that somebody, one of my um, uh, participants who was a presenter, and he said to me, well, "What I do sometimes is, I uh, this was before the time of of internet and uh, you know iPhones on you name it," and he said, "What I used to do was get the person to write the question on his business card." Mm-hmm. and give me his business card so I could get back to him on it. Oh, that's a nice one. And yeah. I said, but why would you do that? And he says, well, basically, he has to make um, a question simple and small to fit on the business card. Uh-huh. And it also gives him the idea it's being personalized because he'd given me his business card. Yeah. And I have all his details on the business card so I can get back directly to him. It's great. And it's a great way of making a contact yeah. and building trust yeah. because that person will then feel very good when yeah. you do get back to them. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting because it goes back to this idea of, of authenticity yeah. and being authentic yeah. sometimes creates a lot more trust yeah. than being the expert. Yeah. And that yeah. uh, has a lot of value, yeah. I think. And, and you can sort of say, what is an expert in presentation? There's no such thing. There are, there are people who are good at presentations. And I know a lot of my train, a lot of my colleagues would probably say, yeah, but there are experts in presentation. Yeah, but they, they change. They're constantly changing. Sure. So if you have to constantly change all the time, you're not an expert in the field. You're learning new things. Yeah, well, I think the, the, the most admirable experts, in quotes, are the ones who are lifelong learners. Huh? So, so can you share, Jerry, an aha moment of a learner who was struggling with presentations and how did he or she get there? Well, it's funny because um, people say, yeah, it's only the low-level people who have this maybe aha mm-hmm. idea. But it can be any level because you can have a person who's quite good in the presentation um, or who who's makes presentations all the time, but he doesn't feel good at the end of his presentation. And, you know, when you have a lower level person who can express himself and he gets um, congratulated by the members of his um, uh, group that he's presenting, that's something really good, and I'll give you something that I have. I had um, a long time ago. I was I was helping a, a PhD student making his uh, PhD thesis presentation, mm-hmm. and when he started the presentation with me at the beginning, he he had forty minutes to make his presentation, and his first presentation was uh, one hour twenty five minutes. Well, that's so long. we had to cut it down. Now it was something that was about nanotechnologies, which was really out of my domain. I mean, yeah. really out of my domain. I knew this the participant really well, mm-hmm. and he eventually we eventually worked on it to cut it down. Mm-hmm. And um, when he he invited me to his um, thesis presentation, and at the end of the presentation, when they deliberated, the, ju- the jury deliberated, and um, I was in the in the amph- in the lecture theatre. And the um, uh, jury said, well, 
they give the the pass mark to all of them. He said, one thing I would like to do is like to congratulate one of the one of the presenters who made an excellent presentation. And it was my student who got this excellent presentation. Right. Uh -huh. And I could see uh, the student just beaming and he looked at me and I just put my finger up to my, my mouth and just said, shh. And, but he came to me afterwards, so it was really something that was really, really good. Yeah, that's fantastic. So it was just something, something great... stranger. Well, that's, that's, you know, we all need those but, moments. But when they, when they come back and they say, you know, I succeeded in what I was, was, was going to present, uh, you know, it's really good. Some people come back and say, do you know, I made a mistake? And I said, yeah, well, so what? You made a mistake. It's not a problem. We can, we can fix it. Right, and the the question is not, you know, the mistake is, did you get your message across? Yeah, yeah. And did the people retain anything yeah. of what you said or enjoy yeah. the yeah. experience? Because when they say they made a mistake, it meant that they didn't get what they, they didn't get a contract or something, and I said, but was it going to be worth it? And he said, no, and I said, well, you didn't make a mistake. And there you go. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's people look at it in different ways, and you have to always, always, always support what they've done, no matter what it is. You have you to give them support. backing, the, the participants, you have to give the participants backing as a trainer. Even if they have a very bad day when the presentation, you sort of, you look for the good points yeah, and not the bad points. You say the bad points are things that you can improve on. Improve, yeah. It's true that a big believer, I'm a big believer in complimenting and yeah. pointing out the, yeah. the positive things because they do have a, yeah. a powerful impact. It, depending on the cultures we work, we're working with, because now we're working with lots of different cultures within our own um, groups now in, for example, in business class, we've got people from China, we've got people from Italy, Romania, Algeria, you know, all different types of, of mm -hmm. nationalities. Sure. And we have to realize that our, our, that in different cultures as well, a mistake is seen differently in different cultures. Right. That's true. Well, Jerry, uh, we know that time is yep. um, precious, but to wrap things up, I'd love to just have your thoughts on your three biggest do's or don'ts, or just what would you sum well, up? I've said sort of come across them, but to um, reiterate them, um, the biggest do is that you have to realize that you're helping them whatever level they're on, they are. Mm -hmm. Okay? You're not here to make them word perfect. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Accept them where they are. Okay, accept what they are, accept what they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you should do as well is find out what the presentation is about so you can more focus your idea instead of giving something that is very wide. Okay, sort of focus on what type of presentation they're going to make and how they're going to say it. Okay, so that's more for you, the trainer, to do yeah. your research. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's something for the um, the trainee that you have to insist on, it's quite simply something we do all of the time in our lives, and it's the idea of to breathe. <laughs> because we have sometimes people who are presenters who have a race to find out how fast they can end a sentence. And the problem is that they say the sentence so fast that nobody understands what they say. So therefore, they're asked questions. Yeah. So take time to breathe when they're presenting. And also to rehearse the presentation. Yes, of course. That's major. And don't, I would say that don'ts are, don't say that a presentation is not good. If you are a trainer, and if it is, for example, if it is not good, you, you don't say it's not good because there are sometimes you have presentations which are disastrous. I've had that experience before in another company mm -hmm. where I had a, a participant who made a presentation which was really bad, and the only um, I tried to get him to change, I tried to mm -hmm. give the good points, he wasn't having it. So I thought, okay, well, what I did was, and this was a long time ago, so I'm talking about things that a lot of you young people might not know anymore, but is <laughs> having a, a cassette and recording <laughs> the person on a, on a audio cassette. Sure. And, and playing it back to him. And he said, uh, I remember him saying to me, I don't understand that presentation. It's total rubbish. And of his I, own? His own. And I said to him, well, listen, it's you. And he says, no, it's not. And I said, listen. And he listened and he said, yeah, it is me. He's making the presentation. And I don't understand myself. Uh -huh. So there are some radical things you can do. And yeah. sometimes it's necessary. 
using okay. technology it's but easy to record. always say you know, it, it, don't, don't tell them it's bad you say you know there are, there's a lot of, there's a room for improvement or there's a lot of room for improvement right okay. be more yeah. positive though. great and don't um, kill yourself if the student and the participant comes back and says the presentation was not good because you as a trainer you're here to help them with their language the way they deliver the language is not your problem afterwards in the presentation yeah. A lot of trainers think, you know, it's my fault they didn't make a good presentation. No. You, you weren't present. You don't know the, what, how the presentation turned out. It could have turned out simply um, just because, some, uh, uh, because somebody has asked difficult questions and the participant couldn't answer or got no help from his colleagues to answer the question. Sure. So there are many elements to a presentation and our role yeah. is the language trainer. Yeah. If you want to go above and beyond and you have the mm. skill to, yeah. to address the more theatrical points yeah. of training, okay, that's one yeah. thing, but remember the baseline is your language yeah. trainer. And, and probably another do that you can think, make the presentation enjoyable. Yeah. For everybody. Yeah, have fun, don't be afraid to have fun have with fun, it. Have fun, don't be afraid, you know, you adapt to it on the day, but don't be afraid to have fun. Excellent. Well, Jerry, these have been excellent as always, You're as welcome. always. I know presentations are kind of a huge... Uh, topic. So if uh, we ever would love to call you back and we could talk more about kind of contents and yeah. more nuts and bolts, would you be open no to that? No problem whatsoever. Huh? That would be awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. And we'll speak to you again sometime, folks. Have Looking a good day. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for joining us in the Business Class ESL Break Room, the podcast designed to bring business English trainers useful ideas, inspiration, and conversation that motivates Follow us on Instagram at business underscore class underscore language and subscribe to the ESL Breakroom playlist on Spotify, Deezer, or Apple Music for new episodes. See you next time.